Should probably start here pretty soon. How are we doing with the mic there, recorder guy? All right. Um, I'm not really used to using these mics, so we'll see how this goes. Um, let me just start with, with prayer, and then um, I can go from there, okay? Uh, so let's bow our heads. Uh, Most Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time together. Um, we thank you, Lord, that um, uh, when we think about things like human trafficking, Lord, that um, even though we may try to do things on our own strength, Lord, that you're in control and that, that you hate injustice and you're standing on, on the side of the oppressed. And so, Lord God, that brings us great comfort. Lord, today, um, I just want to pray that your will would be done. Um, none of this comes out of our own strength or out of our own actions. All of it comes from you. And so, Lord God, may your, glor may your glory be shown today. And um, may students be mobilized to be more aware and to invest more and to um, think about ways in which they can get involved in the fight against modern-day slavery. Lord Jesus, we praise you for this day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, you guys, I've got some pictures, but I don't have uh, a big fancy PowerPoint with which I will entertain or wow you. Um, I just want to say a couple of things up front. Um, sorry, there's not enough chairs, you all. I appreciate, I appreciate you all being here. You should know that this isn't a topic that necessarily is easy to talk about, nor is it something that's easy to really see or witness when it happens, okay? And so none of this is done to sort of entertain you. It's done to inform you and to make you more aware. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about, and if some of you guys heard my sort of my speech at Deeper in the fall, you kind of would understand this a little bit. Um, I was on a series of fellowships at Michigan State to study Swahili and to go to East Africa. In fact, this semester was the semester that I was supposed to have a fellowship and to be in East Africa. Um, through a series of events, though, um, the Lord made it increasingly clear to Amber and I that um, my research shouldn't necessarily be on um, internally displaced people in northern Uganda, but that it should be on this business of modern-day slavery and human trafficking, okay? Um, just to, you know, in a nutshell, the way that worked... Um, was I had studied Swahili for four years and Acholi for one year, and then um, I applied for a Fulbright scholarship to go to Uganda. Actually, it would have been this semester, as I said. Um, that, that program was cut because of the federal deficit situation. Okay? So when that program was cut, um, Amber and I, for a couple of years after I had, I had returned from Cambodia, um, we had sort of felt like... Um, Maybe it wasn't Uganda where I was, we were supposed to go, but maybe we were supposed to focus on these issues of human trafficking. And that was sort of culminated not only in groups the last two or three years coming back and really digging in and engaging themselves, but also through things like this focus series. And the last time I came back, a couple days after I got back, I had a dream, and I'm not one of the people that sees visions in the sky or all this stuff. I mean, I'm not... I tend to actually not put as much stock in that, but I had a dream um, where I was in a brothel area and a little boy said to me, he said, when are you going to help me? And I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh. And Amber was like, Jeremy, what's going on? I was like, and I told her about the dream and she goes, well, I guess you know what you should do your research on then in a very matter of fact way, which is my wife. <laughs> um, so. God has really sort of shaped and sort of led this as far as my research goes. Now, um, my background with this issue, um, I was introduced actually as an undergraduate student to the International Justice Mission because we had had um, an upperclassman while I was here um, named Ryan Cobb who had done um, some, some interesting, well, he had interned with IJM in Kenya. And so I ended up wanting to go to law school and wanting to pursue this. Well, I was fortunate enough during my second summer of my law school to be selected to be an IJM intern in, up in the Andes Mountains in Wanaco, Peru. 
And there we worked on cases of domestic violence and sexual abuse, uh, especially involving children, okay? Um, so that sort of provided a bit of the background. The other background was provided when I um, accompanied Dr. Caleb Chan on a Cambodia cross-cultural in 2007. And then um, in five of the last six years, I was able to take, um, I co-led the first year, and then four out of the next five years, I led the trip with Diane Kurtz, okay? And so through our experiences and what we've learned there and our networking with groups like Not For Sale, uh, International Justice Mission, Agape, right? Some of the, if you guys were at the video last night, I mean, the people that were in Cambodia, like um, most of them we've met and we've worked with before. They're, they're amazing, amazing people. Uh, but it's definitely not limited to them. There's a lot of other people involved. Another thing that I was involved in that really got the momentum going as well and that God used was I was able to go to a conference last fall in Chiang Mai, Thailand. It was called the Asian Pacific Forum on Human Trafficking. And that um, was with a group, Pastor Van Valen, uh, Pastor Whitehead, who's a conference superintendent in the, the Northwest region for the Free Methodist Church, Kevin Austin, and then uh, Ginger Coakley from Greenville, <coughs> And then there was um, another young woman who's working out in, in Washington on these issues, too. Uh, we met some, some people from Malaysia, and, and it was just a great time to learn about this. Conference was sponsored by YWAM, Youth with a Mission, as well as um, Not for Sale. So that's the background behind this. Now, at this point, I'm looking at doing my dissertation on mo more domestic issues with regard to human trafficking. However, in the future years, we're hoping to continue to take students to Cambodia. And for me, I'm hoping to still be able to be involved in conferences and in presentations about this so that I can continue to learn more. Now, that having been said, this isn't a topic that is really exciting to learn about. In fact, um, as some of the students will tell you that have gone on the cross-cultural, it's almost one of those things that sort of God puts on your heart that you almost selfishly you wish that he never had because... It's one of the most horrible things to ever experience, you know, happening in front of you or to go through or something like that. And so that's what I want to talk to you a little bit more about um, today. So my theory body... Hmm? You probably saw the title of, of my talk, and it's Body is Commodity, an Introduction to the Sex Trade in Cambodia and Thailand. And... The theoretical perspective that I want to bring to you as to how to understand this is, it's sort of this process of privatization, okay? So in our world today, you probably have found out, if you haven't, you will soon, when your student loans run out, you've got to get a job and all that kind of stuff. Um, you find out that everything costs something, right? Education costs something. Healthcare costs something. Even water these days costs something, right? Um, there's places where you can go in major urban areas to breathe clean air, okay? So as we see sort of the free market sort of getting their hands into everything, even the most basic needs in our society cost money, okay? Some of you, that may be fine. That's the model you want to use, and that's great, okay? Because for, for the majority of us in here, we have the resources to where we can pay for that, okay? But when you go to certain parts of the United States, and this goes on, as you'll find out today, this goes on in the United States as well, the human trafficking um, phenomenon goes on in the United States, goes on overseas. When you deal with marginalized groups, people have access to only what they can pay for, okay? So some people don't have access to healthy, nutritious food. If you guys have ever tried to buy like whole foods, or you know, foods that are fairly healthy, it costs more, right? It's a lot cheaper to buy lower quality products than it is to buy something that's really, truly good for you. And if you guys haven't thought about that stuff yet, don't worry. I don't think Amber and I really did until we had kids, right? Because <laughs> you, you know, when you consume material, when it's you, it's like, oh, I'm young, I can do it. Um, I think the older I get, the less I realize that I can, I can do that without taking care of myself. So the way this works out is that people who have jobs, who make a decent amount of money, can pay for certain um, goods and services where other people cannot. Okay? 
So those who cannot, as you would, you would have seen last night in Not My Life, they're stuck in difficult positions because they have to make choices about how to take care of themselves, how to survive, and how to feed their families. Okay? Now, given those circumstances, it's very important for you to learn how to, to step outside of your circumstances and your situations. We talk about this all the time in Core 200 and on the Cross Culturals. Okay, if you're not able to step out of your situation and put yourself in someone else's, right, that's the whole compassion idea. When you have compassion for somebody, you suffer with them, right? That's what the word means in the Greek. Okay, that's the, what, the only words that I know it means in the Greek. Rich Cornell is up here. He can help you with the rest of that. But, but um, um, so to think about that, you have to take yourself out of your position and think, you know, well, what if these people would have just made these decisions like I did? Or what if they would have done this like I did? Y'all, not everyone around the world has these great opportunities that you have. And one of the frustrating things about teaching college students is, is that we don't even realize the great opportunities we have, right? People sit and gripe about these opportunities because they have to do work, right? So it's, it's really sort of turning our world on its head Okay, to think about what these other people are like in other situations, in other parts of the world, in other parts of the United States even. One of the things I always tell my students is, what if you were born in mainland China? What if you were born in the slums of, of Mumbai? Okay? How would your life circumstances and your life situation be different? Okay? Because chances are, you would not be sitting here right now. Okay? And just by the fact that, just by the sheer grace of God, you were born where you were, and what sort of, of responsibility does that entail? What sort of obligation does that entail upon you for doing what you're doing, and why? Okay? So to get back to this theor theoretical perspective, people who go without or, or, or live in, in communities or countries where there's very little work are stuck in positions where they have to make difficult decisions. Okay? Now, I know if you were born in the slums of Mumbai, you'd never, ever think about selling your body for sex. I know. You're good Christian people, right? I think it's easy for us to say that, right, having the resources at our disposal that we do. Okay? So I want you to think about it. Put yourself in someone else's position. Okay? I also want you to think about this dynamic of social power. Okay? Because... In a lot of these situations, what you find is you find people who have resources, have access to resources, have skills and talents and abilities, they have a dispro disproportionate level of social power. Okay? So if I'm teaching in a classroom, right, and I've got a group of students here, right, I have a disproportionate amount of social power within that classroom, okay, because I'm viewed as the authority, right? And unless you've really done the work, you don't know whether or not what I'm saying is true or false. Okay? This is why in the Andes Mountains in Peru, teachers who had disproportionate amounts of social power would use that power to manipulate children into going to their house to study after school, right? And abusing them and molesting them and things like that. Because in Peru, the only, one of the only ways to get out of that social, those social circumstances these students find themselves in is to get an education. Okay? Um, the same dynamic happens within families, okay? With parents and children, okay? Dispro disproportionate amounts of social power. Because children listen to their parents, right? They have to trust their parents. And when their parents uh, manipulate them or coerce them or deceive them into doing things they shouldn't, they don't know any better. Those are their parents. Okay? Um, the same thing happens in areas like Sri Pak, where the you know, family members will sell daughters, nieces, grandchildren into, 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 into the sex trade. Okay? So this idea of body as commodity literally is, right? When, you, when we're reduced, Agamben has this term called bare life. When we're reduced to what, what he calls bare life, we put, we're in positions where we have to make very difficult decisions, okay? And by and large, 
women who are involved in the sex trade are viewed as victims. Right? They're viewed as victims because they're, they're, they're involved in these, these course of relationships where there's disproportionate amounts of power. Okay? Now, another thing that I sort of want to sort of encourage you to think about is we don't ever look down or pity people in different positions than we are, ever. Okay? We are not the white elite Christian people that are going to take the gospel to the rest of the world. Okay? That's horribly paternalistic. Okay, because every missions trip I've ever been a part of, now are you going to take the gospel to the rest of the world? Yeah, please do it. Okay, just do it in the right way. Okay, do it in partnership with people. Okay, because I, I don't know any missions trip or any cross-cultural trip, okay, where I've taken a group of students and those students don't come back more changed than the people they're going to go save. Right? And if you know more about our culture, you know we need saving just as much as those people do. Okay, because we're bound by a lot of, you know, we're bound by a lot of different things than they are. We're bound by a lot of apathy, complacency, consumerism, all kinds of stuff that feeds into this. Body as commodity is this idea that the body can be bought and sold. Okay? Just like bottled water. Um, just like food. Just like clothing. Right? The individuals who, um, who come to Cambodia, who come to Thailand with resources, with money, and that's how you're viewed. It is. It's really how you're viewed in these countries. You're viewed as rich, even though you may not have money. Okay? Because the stereotypes and these stigmas and everything that's going on around the world is that, that you're rich. Okay? And so therefore, you know, in the market. Therefore, in these red light areas, you're going to be targeted because you're American, right? And you have all kinds of money, even though that may not be true. People may not um, understand the, the extent of it. So this idea of body as commodity, the theory of it is that in a free market economy where we must expand and expand and expand and where everything costs more and more and more and more money, pretty soon everything we can think of is going to be commodified right? And it's going to cost money, okay? And the people who don't have money or don't have access to jobs, right? And, and, and I hate to say it, but you know, in the United States back in the 80s, we decided that 6 to 7 percent unemployment was full employment, meaning 6 to 7 percent of the population would not have jobs, okay? We're talking about countries where 40 to 50 percent of the populations are unemployed, and there is not work there, okay? Now, there's creative ways to generate jobs, which we need to discuss. There's creative ways to get people involved and employed and stuff like that, right? But we need more people that are, going, that are, that are willing to go and do that, okay? Business people, right? People with very, very creative minds that can start jobs. There's been a lot of examples of this in Cambodia, okay? It's one of the very, very strong preventative tools um, in, in, in putting an end to this. So the, what is that, five different ways that, that we see this happening in Cambodia and in Thailand, or that I have in the experiences that I've had and the reading that I've done and things like this. Um, some of the worst cases are pedophilia cases. You heard Don Brewster, if you saw Not My Life. Don runs the Agape organization that um, is one of the most credible aftercare facilities in Cambodia, okay? Um, I met Don this last November in Thailand, and he's an amazing man. Um, and one of the things he said is the, the most brutal pedophiles, that these, these girls that, they, that are rescued by IJM, one of the, uh, they said the most brutal pedophiles in all the world come from the United States. Okay? Now, one of the ways that, that we've seen this, pedophilia can be found anywhere in, in these examples. But one of the ways that we saw this this last year was there's a place um, called Wat Phnom. Oh, this thing's going to misbehave. There it goes. This is Wat Phnom. I don't know how to, to maximize that. This is Wat Phnom. It's in the northeast part of the city. And it's, there's, it's almost like there's a, so there's this big plot of land, right? 
and the Wapanam is in the middle, but it, it's like there's there's like it's like concentric circles where you could walk around and you go higher and higher up to Wapanam. Okay? But this area, it's like a stone's throw from the U.S. Embassy from some of the nicest hotels right near the U.S. Embassy in Phnom Penh. Um, train station is nearby. But this year, we saw some of this going on. There was a, a, a European man who sat at a bench. And there's networks of women that have girls that bring the girls to these, these European men. And so, like, there was a group of people that were going into this art place. It's like this art museum. You remember that place? And, like, I was just like, I'm going to sit out here and see what, I see what I can find. Right? And I'll just sit out here and just look. And me and, I think it was me and Willie just sat there for a while, just looked. And then one of the other students came, and we were just sort of, like, observing. And it was, it was interesting to see the human networks that were involved here. Okay, this is also a place where if you want to go to Sarai Pak, you can get a tuk-tuk driver like in a second to take you out there. Okay, so some of these monuments where Westerners go, the traffickers go to these places in order to um, entice, traf or entice Westerners to go and pay for sex, right? Um, if you've read some of the IJM work, you know that you know, girls young as, as young as like three and four have been bought and sold for sex in, in these places. Um, and one of the sort of the appeals there is that if a, uh, a child is smaller, you can get more money for the child. So um, there's, there's, it's really, you know, revolves around greed and just horrible perversion of, of sexuality and sex, right? Um, yeah, there's, yeah. So another, the, another one of the ways in which the body is manifest as commodity is through brothels. And this is sort of like becoming a more, it's becoming an older model because the traffickers are having to adapt to a lot of the NGOs and the law, some of the law enforcement. As you guys know, in the developing world, the law enforcement is actually, can very much be the enemy in cases like this. Um, but the, the brothels, um, and this is, uh, I got firewalled when I first searched this, so. Um, but like, this is, this is called Buding. Um, this is a, um, it's like an old, old housing structure. Um, it's in southeast Phnom Penh. It's um, located sort of near a very, very touristy area when we went to see the fireworks for New Year's Eve, this is maybe a couple blocks down for some of the larger, from some of the larger hotels and casinos there. Um, but it is, it is typically known as the Red Light District. It's also near the, the Royal Palace and the National Museum and stuff like that. So there's a lot of access for Westerners there. The brothels, um, the way these work, this was actually the place where two years ago we did sort of a walk through at night. Um, the way that, like if I'm, there's a restaurant that we go to called Khmer Village. And if you go down the block a couple, this, this, this was a whole interesting story in and of itself. I'll try to be short. We were supposed to go to a Thai restaurant. I said Philemon, everybody wants Thai. Can we go to a Thai restaurant? She's like, yeah, yeah, we'll go to a Thai restaurant. We show up at a Khmer restaurant. I'm like, Philemon, everybody's going to be mad, you know? Anyway, great restaurant though. Like, great restaurant. But I get out of the bus, and I see two blocks down this place. And I was immediately like, yeah, I know that place. Um, I've heard about that place before. So anyway, I um, end up going down there. And the way that Bu Ding is, is on a boulevard called Sotaro. And it's one, he's one of the kings, former kings. And there's an alley that runs back here, and then Sotaro runs this way. And so I took a group of students. One of our students was doing the, the, the mini lecture on international justice mission and sex trafficking the next day. And we just like walked through there, right? We come, we walk through there and we're kind of like, hmm, like what's going on? And one of the things that's important, I'll get to this with awareness. If you don't know about a social issue, you'll walk past it 20 times before you know what's going on, 
Okay, so if you don't understand poverty, you don't understand racism, you don't understand, you know, um, healthcare issues, if, if you don't understand those issues, you're less likely to be informed about what's going on and you'll pass those issues a million times before you'll ever do anything, right? Um, and that's what happened to us. I mean, we walked in back and, you know, sort of said a, you know, we said a, a short prayer, Lord, if there's anything you want us to see here, would you let us know? We walk back through with the guys in front and the girls flanking us in back, okay? Because if the girls were with us, they're not going to say anything to you, right? And as soon as we got out of this place, this old man on like an old chair, like an old, what do you call those things, lawn chairs? It's so hard to remember things. Anyway, <laughs> he's sitting on a lawn chair, and this guy like grabs my arm. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And, and Vanny and Weez and Michaela and Steph, they were all like kept going. And... Um, and it was, it was smart on their part because if they stopped, then I'd been in trouble. But he starts, and he, start, he knew some English, which was kind of weird because some of the children know English, but, you know, if, if they're older, they're more likely to learn to know French. Um, he's, he's like, starts, you want a girl, right? And all of a sudden, I get all these goosebumps, and I'm like, this is creepy. So he starts going through, and we talk about, you know, what girls they have. Anyway, there was a brothel in this place. It was actually back this way. It was in, a, in, a, it was in a, a room right here, and there were girls there, and he gave me prices, he told me what services they do, and all of that stuff. Um, and and it, was, it was absolutely horrible. Like, I, I probably won't ever be able to forget that whole thing, because it's just brutal. And the sense of evil you get is just unlike anything you've ever felt before, right? And I don't say that to glamorize it, because it's not like that. It's, it's horrible. It's disgusting. An another time this year, we stood across Sotero, and Nate Skolton said, what about you know, that place where these guys are? Well, Dave Darling and I walk across Sotero, and there's like a little median there. And we stand on the other side, and we're just standing there, you know, hanging out. Boom, two guys walk up. What do you, what do you guys want? You want girls? We have girls, come on over. We have all kinds of girls, and they show us the girls and everything like that. And it was like, you know, immediately when you walked over there, right? Another time, Willie and I went over there across the street, like a block away from this place. Two guys sitting on a couch. Stand up, walk over, start talking to us, right? Now, I said this is sort of an old way to do this. The reason why is because now, um, if you keep the girls on site, you're more likely to get busted than if you don't. So now what you see more of at Booting is you see it's sort of like a network, right? There's the boys that will come up and solicit. There's the girls that are hanging out there on the motos. They're very, like, scantily dressed, and they look terrified. And then there's moto drivers. So you can call, and they'll send them to you, right? Because it's a lot, they're a lot less likely to get caught that way, okay? Um, and... From what we've heard from the NGOs, they're having to adapt to that model now. So how do you, you know, apparently the Khmer law says that it's illegal when you have a brothel, but it's not when these girls are going because it appears consensual or something like that, right? Um, which actually, as a sociologist, I have a hard time believing prostitution is consensual, to be honest. Um, and so I don't, even, I don't even like to use that word. I understand that, you know, it's, it's very often that a woman can, can agree to a financial transaction and so on and so forth. But almost always that woman is working for someone who's using coercion and deception to pressure her into making money. And so it really gets complicated. You know, in addition to those things, you know, a lot of women have been through horrible situations which make them feel, as you saw in the movie, like they're nothing. So, like, it becomes very difficult for me to buy into the fact that if there weren't these alternatives, that we couldn't do at least somewhat better with this, right? All right. Um, so, the motos and the lineups. This was something that we sort of um, learned more about this year. Um, there's an area that's v infamous for human trafficking or for sex trafficking and for brothels 
Uh, the IGM's never been able to raid, okay? Um, it's called Street 63, and it goes from the mall and the central market, again, tourist areas, okay? The mall and central market all the way down to the south end of the city, okay? Now, the area where the brothels and a lot of the, the human trafficking happens is further north towards central market. And, you know, I would, you know, about halfway through the trip in the first few years, I would go up, there's this burger place. It's like, um, it's like a white castle in Cambodia, right? Ugh. <laughs> I went there a couple of times our first year. Um, you know, because you, you go and you have a nice meal, and then you go someplace else, you try to save a little bit of money, you try to offset it, you know? I mean, that's, that's what I do sometimes. But we went to this burger place, and I'm telling you, I've never been more sick in Cambodia than when I went to this burger and fry place, ever. So, like, I would go in there then, and I would, like, get a Sprite, and I would let students, like, just hang out at the mall, you know, for a couple hours, and I would grade journals, right? So I'm, I'm in the, you know, and there's these glass windows. You can see down on 63. So that there's two reasons why I'm sitting there. The first reason is to get through some of these journals. The second thing is to be able to see what's going on on 63. Well, you know, mid to late afternoon, you start seeing, you know, white men with young Khmer girls. And they're walking up and down the street. And, you know, the guys, they'll take the girls to get something to eat, and then they'll take them back to their hotel, right? And then they'll return them or whatever. So you can see this mid afternoon on so I would see the first couple years I would see this see this see this well the last couple years I thought okay I want to go down there when you know this is going on and maybe like just snoop around a little bit I'm sort of inquisitive <laughs> so like I, I went through I walked through some of the alleys walked through some of the different places to see what's going on nothing nothing right so I'm like okay too early I'm gonna go down there later right so one night, a group of us go down there, and it's like 8 or 9 o'clock, right? Stay in the major streets, walking around, walking around, walking around. On 63, there's one block that's fairly dark, but it's light in between and on the other blocks. So we walk through this block, and there's like a little moto parking area. It's like a, there's like these, you know, um, these sheet metal walls, and then there's an entryway where like, it looks like it's like a bus depot or like a, a tuk-tuk depot, you know, those little, these little things. <laughs> Tuk-tuks are fun, but not as fun as motos. If you can get going on a moto at night in Phnom Penh, I always tell people, if I'm not a college professor, I'm going to drive a moto. I don't care if it won't. I'll drive motos all over the city. I don't care if it won't pay my student loans. It'd be sweet. Anyway. Um, there's this like moto park. I gotta remember where I was. <laughs> there's like this moto park, right? And there's these this lineup of girls there. And I'm like, okay. And then all of a sudden, around the corner, there's these, these guys driving these motos with girls on the back. You want a girl? You want a girl? And these guys didn't speak English like the old man did. I was like, you know, so they're typing on their cell phones how much girls are. And they're like putting, you know, they're trying to, I don't know. I don't know what you guys do on the cell phones these days, but like they're putting like numbers on there. I have a cell phone, I know how to use one. <laughs> but like um, it gets to Facebook and tweeting and all that stuff, I don't know. So like, you know, they're putting the prices on there, they're putting the, the letters and all that stuff on there and I'm just like, um, but you know, so they've got lineups in there, they've got people driving motos, driving motos, and, and they're persistent. Right, they're following us. They're following us. You know, they're trying to try to sell us the girls and stuff like that. And it's, I've never, that was pretty intense this year. Now on an adjacent street to 63, um, or a parallel, parallel, yeah, the next parallel street. It's been a while since I've taken math. Okay, parallel street, okay, is Street 54. They don't run in order. As Jacob Barrio and, all, Barrio and I found this year, we were trying to, we were trying to find uh, where Hagar moved to. But like, we got there like an hour after everybody else did because we, I took a moto, and I loved trying to find my way around. It didn't work out so well that time. Um, there's, an, there's a parallel street called Street 54. Street 54 is lined with bars, okay? Um, 
but there's an area by a, a small mall where it's just like bar after bar after bar and it's like western style bars so um, the way that these work this is the fourth point the bar girls point and this is something that you find all over the world the bar girl thing especially I've read a lot about you find brothels all over the world too you can find the the different the different systems um, all over the world too the bar girl phenomena is this phenomenon where you know you're a westerner you're in Phnom Penh you've had such a hard day seeing all the sights the tourists it's so hard looking at all the tourist sites so hard because Cambodia they don't work that hard you know they don't work like 12 14 okay that's sarcasm all right you've had a hard day you know it's just hard walking through that royal palace you know it's just so hard so what do you want to do you want to go get a drink okay so you go to these bars you sit down you sit down you have a drink and these my girls come over and start talking to you talking to you talking to you right um, the custom is you buy them a drink, several drinks, talk, 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 right? You decide which one you want. You go to the bar owner, who's like the pimp in this case. You negotiate with him for the girl, and then you take her, okay? Now, I, this never happens in the United States, right? It happens all the time in the United States. I can tell you how many friends I know that when they go home, what's the first thing they do? Go to the bar, hang out, and you meet somebody in a bar. Now, I'm not saying you can't meet somebody in a bar. Meet somebody in a bar, you could, maybe it's gonna be a long, long life for you, I don't know. But, not necessarily someplace, I would necessarily go to meet somebody, but this happens in places like the United States too, right? It's not necessarily where you go and you pay the bar owner, I mean, she may just come home with you. You may not have to pay for her, right? So. Some of these things, the body is commodity sort of transcends cultures. And I don't want to say that it's just Cambodia where stuff like this happens. But that's sort of the, the bar girl phenomenon. The last one is the massage parlor phenomenon. And as we think about how this overlaps with things that go on in the United States, I want you guys to think about, you know, Vanny's presentation is on, you know, the, 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 the massage parlors in Jackson. And it's not just in Jackson, it's like, all along I-94, right? I just got back from my Chicago weekend. Craig Box, I'm still bitter that you didn't drive for me, but there's always another chance. No, <laughs> Craig's driven for me before, so I'm just giving him a hard time. Um, but like, you see like bar, you see like massage parlor after massage parlor after massage parlor after gentleman's club after whatever, after whatever, after whatever, right? These places normally congregate near truck stops and or adult material places, right? I don't know what you call them. <laughs> but like, these, these massage parlors, the same model as you see in places like Cambodia and Thailand. Now, in Thailand, this is more prevalent than in Cambodia. Okay, so there's a massage parlor, there's girls sitting out in front, you walk by, hey sir, you want massage? I'm like, no, I'm good, thanks. Hey, sir, you really like massage? I'm like, no, no, I'm good. You really like? I'm like, no, see ya, bye. Right? So, like, it's tough. You know, can you go in there and get a back massage? Yeah, I heard they're really good. I don't like people touching my body, to be completely honest with you. Like, I don't, it's just like, I don't know you, don't touch my body. <laughs> right? But, like, can you go in there and get a back massage? I'm sure. They, they supposedly give great foot massages. Kevin Austin goes and gets these foot massages all the time. I'm like, I don't want people touching my feet. I don't know why people would want to touch my feet. I always smell the best, right? So like, you think about stuff like that. So there's a massage parlor, and in these places often front as legitimate businesses, okay? They front as legitimate businesses, but everybody kind of knows what goes on, right? Um, so there's different services provided there. So the theory, right, is this idea that as the free market expands and expands and expands, people sell what they have to make it, especially if there are very little opportunity or very, there are very few opportunities elsewhere. Okay, the evidence that I've given you, the, the forms that I've seen it most in Cambodia and in Thailand, the, the phenomena of pedophiles going to these places to get cheap sex. Another thing, you know, not to just shrink it down to the pedophilia thing, 
but there's evidence of like sex tours, like of like garnering business deals. Like so Koreans, Korean sex tours will go to places like Siem Reap where all the ruins are, right? Um, or Phnom Penh, and this will be part of closing a deal. Like you'll take care of the business people that come and visit you by taking them to Siem Reap and setting them up with some like really sort of well-off brothel, okay? And so that, you know, you take care of them that way. There are these business sex packages, guys. I mean, they, they exist. It's not just, you know, these people that are like, you know, and then we, we found that out here too. We found that out here too in Jackson. So it's not just a certain group that's doing this. There's a lot of people that you would not suspect that are involved in these things, okay? And what you have to consider is too, is if government political, you know, politics, business, whatever, didn't want them to exist, then guess what? They wouldn't. <laughs> right? So, at some level, you wonder who's involved and how. Right? Which makes it very difficult talking to political figures and other people because you don't know who's in on stuff. You really don't. Uh, some people kind of have the theory that, you know, like, government is just kind of like, the strongest gang that won out, <laughs> you know? Anyway, um, so these are sort of the different ways in which we see it in Cambodia. Now, I don't want to leave you with a bunch of information and have you not think about what to do, okay? Um, first and foremost, when you see some of the things that go on with this overseas, you read about them, you watch sort of the Not My Life video or the Nefarious video or, you know, um, I've got one called Trade that I show in Core 2. Um, when you see these movies, um, my understanding is based on the gravity of these problems is that if I try to do this or anyone tries to do this on his or her own strength, you will burn out, okay? There is no way that any group of individuals is going to put all their strength into this and to, to eliminate it, okay? Um, especially since, as we, we see with the brothels to the, the moto transition, that when the forces of God sort of step up and fight, the enemy adapts as well, okay? So as much as I would like to think by the time, you know, Kevin Austin will say, by the, the time I die, I want to see modern-day slavery taken care of, right? not going to happen, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that we can't make a dent in it or fight back, okay? I think the knee-jerk response is to be overwhelmed with apathy, to figure, oh, my gosh, I'm a college student. What can I do, right? Well, you can do a lot. You can do a lot. Okay, you can tell other people about it, right? You can spread the word. You guys get all on Facebook and Twitter and whatever you do. <laughs> spread the word, right? Secondly, you are some of the most privileged people on the face of the earth, okay? But you don't know it, right? Gary Britton always said, uh, he's a business prof, he would always say college students are the only group of people I know that will pay $30,000 for something and complain about it, right? You are developing skills and talents and abilities now, or you should be. If you're not, you better talk to Jesus about that. Right? If you're not, you, you, better, you better start doing it now. You're developing skills and talents and abilities that you can use to go out and to change the, the futures, which you'll hear with Not For Sale, of people every single day. And it doesn't have to be halfway around the world. Okay? It can be here. It can be in your backyard. Okay? So, so teachers, guess what one of the, 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 the best things you can do is? You spend a year in Cambodia and you can give people hope, you give people a chance to compete for jobs. Because guess who the people are that are most vulnerable? They haven't completed any education, they haven't learned any English, right? They haven't sort of, you know, done any internships or got any sort of jobs or anything like that. That's why what Linda Adams and others are doing through the ICCM is so important, right? Because they're, they're sponsoring children throughout school. Those children are less likely to turn to human trafficking or to, to selling their body as a commodity than children who don't become supported that way. Those of you who are business, right, or anything related to business, 
great, great models for job creation in places like Cambodia, right? Find a niche, develop, you know, train people on how to do something, and watch them. You pull them, you know, International Justice Mission is constantly looking for good organizations that, that where they can put people that have pulled, been pulled out of the sex trade, right? We go to restaurants. We spend money in these places to support them. Women that cook our food and serve us at tables and do different things there, they've been pulled out of the sex trade. There's all kinds of room for improvement with that, right? Now, now the, the efforts with that tend to focus on, like, sewing, um, food catering, because those are the models that have worked, you know, um, fixing motos. But I'm telling you guys, there's, there's so much of an oversupply in those areas. We need people to creatively think of new ways to create jobs in these places, not just the same old ones. Anybody can do that, okay? Not just the same old, same old, right? Um, so there's a lot of ways. Think creatively about ways in which you can get involved in your major. Social workers, right? A lot of social work majors. It's one of the largest majors at Spring Arbor now, right? Social workers, the aftercare piece of this, right? Youth pastors, getting children involved, right, with the church at that level, okay? I've seen students that are, that are youth men people that will go to other countries, whether it's Cambodia or Uganda, and it's like they're rock stars, right? Like they could get a job right away. They, they, the people are drawn to them. You can use that Americanness, that whiteness to, to bring people to church and to get involved. Right, and I, I could go down on and on and on with the, your majors. I don't want to do that because I have to stop talking at some point, and I need you to ask me questions. So, it's not going to happen without God. Not going to happen without God. Okay, I am in. You know, I have a firm belief that this is not something we can do on our own strength. We absolutely have to 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 trust God in doing what we're doing, safety wise. Um, for any sort of cure or solution to this issue. It's so broad and so complicated. There's absolutely no way that we can do this on our own strength. We're just too imperfect, right? We're too sinful. We need God's redemption in our own lives and we need God's redemption in society or else it's not gonna happen, okay? Um, last one, give, okay? You should be thinking about now, right now, ways in which you can get involved in the fight against modern day slavery. Now, this takes a lot of different forms. It's not just like human trafficking issue, right? If you're a teacher, if you're a youth pastor, if you want to be a youth pastor, if you want to be a, you know, a, a social worker, if you, you know, you want to be a, a, do small business, do business development, microenterprise, whatever, you can get involved and I would encourage you to, to pray to God, right? You can do that instead of freaking out right? You can pray about what you're supposed to be doing after graduation. And it's a lot better way than getting together and freaking out with everybody. Or talking to your parents and having them freak you out because you're not doing a job that makes enough money or something, right? So like, pray to God about this and make decisions now about how you're going to live your life then. You know, it's very easy to get a job. Go buy that nice house because all your friends are doing it. Go get a nice car that makes you look cool, right? And then guess what? You're working like a dog to pay that stuff off, right? You live simply, you'll have a lot more money to give to people, to give to causes for this, and you'll have a lot more time to invest in things like this, okay? But it has to come through conscious, making conscious decisions to live simply, you hear that live simply so others can simply live, right? <coughs> Cliche, catchphrase. Anyway, but like, but, but really it's true, right? Buy something simple. Make sure you can get by on, very, on a lot less than the majority of Americans do, right? That's one of the things that ticks me off the most, right? Is we're entitled to the standard of living because we're these Americans, right? No way, okay? Live simply so that others can live. Make good decisions about how you live. Then you'll be able to invest your time. Then you'll be able to invest your money. And you won't get caught up in the rat race. Um, yeah, I better, I'll stop there. Will you guys ask me some questions? Something I didn't cover. I'll assume a lot more than I really explain. So if 
there's something you want to ask about, then please, please let me know. If you don't ask questions, I'll just keep talking. Because <laughs> it's hard to fit this into an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, where would that be? Because, I mean, I lived in Thailand, so I've been to massage parlors, but it's yeah. like, you know, like the malls or like at night bazaar, where there's like, I don't know, it was just like the business there. And it was a way for them to earn money. But, sure. like, I was wondering where you could find the massage parlors that we're talking about. Yeah. Not exactly that. The ones by the night market, at least I can only speak to Chiang Mai, okay? I really wanted to go to Bangkok, but like 85% of it was underwater. <coughs> What's that? Yeah, by the, you know the night market? Yeah, I know. That, there's massage parlors all over there. Okay, but like, I mean, around which area though? Or do we have to go around? Because there are, like in the night market, there's you know, the upper level there. Yep. Over there, those are like actual businesses, but I'm not sure which ones are talking The about. ones that are outside. Okay. Like, so um, we stayed at the Riverside Hotel or Guest House, which is right along the river. You cross that iron, the sort of that iron bridge to get across. Down that alley, there were like several, right? So you guys, I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't legitimate massage parlors. I'm sure there are, right? But I don't know. You know, maybe they just wanted to rub my back. Yeah, I, so I think there are. There's, I think there's a lot of stuff that goes on, and you're going to be treated differently than I would be, too. So, yeah, what else? Yeah, Claire. Yeah. Very difficult. Very, very difficult because the NGOs that work on these issues cannot go in and pro pull girls out. They've got to have the buy-in of local law enforcement. And that the buy-in is easier than, you know, the, the Street 63, right? That's one of the areas that I've heard repeatedly they've tried to shut down. Every single time somewhat, uh, somebody's tipped off and the girls are gone when they go in and do a bust. So what happens is... With corrupt law enforcement officials, um, with corrupt law enforcement officials, you often find like there are cops that will compete to get those areas because they can extract bribes from the business owners. So, like in a lot of these countries, there's a patronage system. So the the way that like you pass a test is that you've got to slip some money to the to the teacher, right? Or you know, and then that teacher to get that position has to pay the superintendent or the, the principal. And so like, in order to run that sort of business that's often illegal, there's some money exchanging hands um, that normally, you know. So if you work with law enforcement and that guy gets tipped off, then you're not gonna be able to make the bus that you thought you would. And I mean, even they will, they'll talk about the different responses that police will give them. If the police say, yeah, we'll look into this, then it normally means nothing's ever going to get done. But if the police say something like, okay, let's, you know, um, I think we could, we could work together on this or something like that, it normally means, and there's even been cases where, um, and I, I saw this in Peru as well, where you, they tried to buy you, you off, right? So in, uh, investigators on behalf of these different NGOs that work against human trafficking um, um, are often... They, they try to buy them off or they threaten their lives. And you guys, this is a very, very dangerous thing for the investigators, right? I think your point over here, though, is valid in the sense that, like, what are, we cannot go in and pull people out of places when this stuff goes on unless they have alternatives, right? The, I think the average um, victim of, of human trafficking goes back something like seven times. If you've heard that data before, it's the same with battered women, okay? So you've got to learn how to break the cycle and create new futures so that people don't keep going back. I hope I tied those. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, Jessica. Would it have been dangerous for you to go up and talk to one of those, like, Western 
Are the white Westerners? Western. No. Not the Westerners. No. I don't think talking to the Westerners would necessarily have been a, a dangerous thing. I think we have to be careful going where we go sometimes. Yeah. Guys, thanks. I know there's a 10 o'clock. <laughs>